Welcome to Health Plus Tech, the show where we explore the law that applies at the intersection of healthcare and technology. Your hosts, Andrea Linna and Kristen Woodrum, are healthcare attorneys and partners at McGuire Woods LLP, a law firm of over 1,000 attorneys with offices throughout the United States and the world. Welcome, everyone. Go ahead and get started. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. I'm Kristen McDermott Woodrum. I am a healthcare partner in the Atlanta office of McGuire Woods. And I'm joined tonight by Andrea Lena, who is a partner based here in Chicago. Andrea and I co-lead our firm's digital health, technology, and innovation practice, which is really focused on that intersection of healthcare and technology. And tonight we thought before the broader McGuire Woods Healthcare Private Equity and Finance conference kicks off, we'd hold a more intimate event focused just on digital health. Um, I think to kick things off, we would like to um, focus on kind of where we are today in digital health. Looking back, there's been so much investment over the past few years, so much attention in digital health. And we want to look forward as well. We've worked with a lot of clients who have invested in and developed digital health solutions that have really helped healthcare organizations improve their operations, their clinical um, experience, and their financial performance. And we've had the opportunity to help clients develop and implement new care delivery and payment models based on this technology. So, um, we really love this area, and we wanted to invite Devin Cardi from our adventures here to talk to us so we could ask him some of the hard questions that we have. I'll turn it over to Andrea to introduce Devin and to cover anything I missed. And uh, we're going to hold a little bit of time at the end for questions from the audience. So think of, think of your hard questions for Devin as well. Thanks again. Poor Devin. <laughs> Um, well, great to have everyone here. We're thrilled to see you. Many um, familiar faces, so thanks for joining us. Um, super excited to have you, Devin. We're absolutely thrilled. I was telling people earlier when I looked at your bio, I thought, you can't be a real person, can you? Yeah. You're so impressive. You have so many amazing things. So I'm going to read off your bio for, for everyone. Um, you are CEO of Martin Ventures, healthcare-focused venture capital firm where you lead the investment committee, build and scale de novo companies, and oversee 30 plus portfolio companies. You also have worked as a biologist and biochemist with NASA, built medical clinics in the jungles of Congo, Africa, and pursued healthcare solutions as an entrepreneur, venture capitalist, and hospital system leader. Um, I think on the tables too and throughout there is um, Devin's full bio. He has founded many companies, um, invested in all names that you would all know, so please take a look at those. We are thrilled to have you, um, absolutely thrilled for you to be here, and really excited to hear about your perspective on digital health, all of the investments that you've done, and all the companies you've founded and started. I think you just have a fantastic um, perspective that I know all of us are interested to hear about. So thank you again for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Truly. So, as I mentioned, there's been enormous investment and interest in digital health and venture capital, um, but Martin Ventures has a different approach, and so we were hoping you'd share your investment thesis. Absolutely, and uh, before we do that, I think it's really important to say happy birthday okay. to you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. It's the year for us. I'm burning the candle at both ends. This is a birthday party. Uh, we'll have the birthday candles later. Uh, so again, thank you so much for having me. I really do appreciate it. Uh, anytime somebody puts keynote next to me, I always get nervous because that's not like what I'm designed to do. But um, so let me kind of explain Martin Ventures. So we're a boutique uh, healthcare venture capital firm based out of Nashville. Um, I'd say the unique aspects of our firm uh, is that we're actually none of us are finance people. So all of us have been together on the low end, 18 years, on the high end, uh, 45 years running acute care hospitals. And so the guy whose name's on the wall, Charlie Martin, has um, founded and built uh, several uh, multi-billion dollar healthcare systems. Uh, he took four of them public, uh, sold two to HCA and two to Tenant. The last two, the last three he sold for 5.3 billion, 1.8 billion, and 4.3 billion. Um, 
And the operating team at Martin Ventures is that team. So we were all with him through those different endeavors. Uh, most of us uh, during the uh, Vanguard days. Um, and so when Vanguard sold to Tenant in 2013, Charlie launched Martin Ventures with this thesis of how do you start to innovate around the healthcare ecosystem, making truly a positive impact, uh, but leveraging the differentiation that Martin Ventures has uh, from an operational standpoint. Uh, the other unique aspect uh, that I'd say with Martin Ventures is that everybody in the firm has operated uh, a hospital or has operated a hospital or a hospital system, uh, and has also started a company. Uh, so they lived on the entrepreneur world and also lived in the in the um, uh, world of, of healthcare. Uh, and the last piece is we don't have a fund, and so uh, we invest our own personal capital into every company that we do. Charlie's leads the way; the rest of the team uh, invests into each of these companies. With the deals basically every round, every deal. And so when you look at the portfolio, we've had 50 investments since 2015. Um, we've exited 15, and we have a portfolio of about 35, but of all of them being healthcare related, uh, except one, we have an at home vet company. Um, and the reason we did the at home vet company is because we tried all these really difficult companies in at home infusion therapy and uh, contested doing at home immersion care. We're like, you know what's really easy is vets. <laughs> they don't have to deal with, deal with regulations or anything. So we launched a, a vet company as well. <laughs> um, the thesis of which we invest on, we really have three outside of that one, is um, value-based care. So we are, we are huge believers that um, value-based care is finally here. And we've been talking about this, so everyone's attended every HIMSS and Health and J.P. Morgan conference for the last 20 years. Uh, we have been talking about value-based care, and I don't think that it's, I don't, I think that it's finally here. I think the COVID tailwinds kind of pushed us there. When you look across the healthcare ecosystem, I still only believe about 5% of the total, you know, uh, cost of overall care is in value-based care arrangements, but our belief is that it's moving there and moving more rapidly than it ever has in the past. And so our first thesis around value-based care um, is, uh, and I should have mentioned this on the other side of uh, Martin Ventures, is, we like to launch our own companies. And so we like to write the business plan, capitalize it, put the, cap, uh, put the humans in place and, uh, and the team in place, and then scale it. Uh, and we've also found a really good niche in doing that with other hospital, with hospital systems or payers or other financial partners like A16 or, or Thrive or others, uh, who we find to be really good partners. And then the rest come from the outside. And so when you look at our value-based care thesis, we launched a company doing advanced primary care uh, called Wabana. And so our thesis there was that there's um, there's a big opportunity to move uh, providers that are PCPs or independent living in a fee-for-service world to a value-based world. They simply need the technology, the humans, the contracting, the technology to be invested in them, and most of them don't have that. And so that's the thesis for that company, and even it's even evolved more into helping hospital systems do that exact same. And uh, the next aspect of value-based care that we really believe in is being able to pick off every one of the specialties, especially the high-cost specialties. So think oncology, um, MSK, uh, renal and dialysis, uh, CKD, and um, uh, neuro, being able to pick off every one of those and move those to value-based arrangements as well. And our belief is like companies like Wellbana that are in advanced primary care, so CAMOs and uh, Agilons and Oaks and all of these organizations aren't going to be able to manage all of the risk associated with their specialties, and so they can use these other companies to basically subcap their risk uh, around each one of those specialty arrangements. And so we've done every one of those other than cardi or cardiology uh, from a high cost standpoint, um, not because we don't believe in it, we just haven't figured out the right business model around it. And so we've evaluated a bunch of companies, we've also you know, built some plans, but we don't think we have. Yeah, you talked about sort of the three sort of investment theses, yeah. and one was the opportunities in the value-based care. And I know you founded an investment contessa. I'm um, not sure if a lot of people are very familiar with that. And we talked the other day about reimagined care, which is the oncology at home. Um, if you could touch a little bit more on that before we move into the kind of other investment theses that you've. Absolutely. Yeah. So um, you know, contessa was actually the first business plan that actually you know was written and then launched and a uh, guy that was actually with Vanguard, Travis Messina, had founded that company, wrote the business plan, and, and did a fantastic job growing and scaling that company until 
uh, the exit of the metasis. You know, the belief there was that there are patients that are currently living in the emergency room that are currently going into telemetry, inpatient, uh, or observation to have the option to go in to, to the home. And so that was the entire business model around that. Similarly, with oncology, uh, you know, we believe when we originally wrote that plan, uh, and this is you know only two years ago, uh, that there are a number of patients. We believe somewhere close to 70 to 80 percent of patients that are currently getting infusion therapy in the hospital that could be getting infusion therapy in the home. And so the thesis there is, how do you help move them there? The reason that doesn't move. Uh, is mainly due to the fact that if you, if a doctor dispenses Keytruda in a patient, um, the reimbursement in a hospital system is close to 42000 on average. So, uh, same drug, same patient in the home on a one-to-one nurse-patient ratio versus an eight-to-one is closer to 12-5. So 42 to 12-5 is the difference in the reimbursement of that. So if you go back to the 90s, you know, when site of care transitioned into the ambulatory surgery centers, that's what we believe is next in the infusion therapy, not just oncology, but across many of the other infusion therapies, and there's other companies that are obviously doing that. Um, but we believe, again, with reimagined care, it's number one about symptom management being able to monitor the patients, two, it's, it's transition of care uh, into a lower cost, still clinically appropriate area, uh, which we believe is the home. And when you can do those two in, in simultaneous effect, then you have the ability to do some kind of value-based arrangement or risk-based arrangement. And the payers, I'm assuming they're very receptive <laughs> um, you think so. Uh, I, I'd say, as we think about those areas, um, I, use my comments carefully. I, I think that there are pockets of that that are occurring within petri dishes across the U.S. from a payer perspective, but it's certainly not scaled. I think the bigger opportunities, at least in the near term, when you look at value-based care, and we use it just so generically, like every patient should be in value-based care, and that's not the case. It should be segmented based on patient populations and different payer arrangements. But payers, uh, if you think about like the ACO REACH program, or if you think about the MA program, or, or duels, or even PACE, like those are perfect programs that are already in risk-based arrangements that now have the ability to take that risk and move that into sub-cap arrangements with these different um, uh, specialty organizations. And that's really where we're on the initially. And I think over time, you'll start to see that move more into the commercial world or even the direct employers. But right now, the, you know, the bigger opportunities certainly Medicare reimburses. So take note, everyone. The headlines are about Amazon and One Medical in the primary care, but you can have that subcaptated primary care. Sure. Yeah. So one thing we'd like to touch on is what is your philosophy around artificial intelligence in healthcare? So it's touted as being able to improve quality, uh, patient experience, um, reduce errors, um, reduce paperwork. What, how do you look at it? Um, what is it? Where is it useful now? Where are you investing? Where are you still hesitant? Yeah, um, and I should have mentioned that you know one big piece of source value is here. The other is AI, and the, and the third uh, that we're playing is, is really analytics. Um, and so uh, around AI, we've we've made a, a several investments. The most recent uh, actually just got announced yesterday, which was a technology that was built uh, inside Mass General. And the, the technology was focused on being able to um, bring AI into coders. So most of these hospital systems have thousands of thousands of people that are coding in the background. And so our thesis is there's an area where it's not affecting inpatient care today. It's not making care decisions, um, but it's a high labor item. It's hard to get coder, good coders in there. Um, and every one of these hospital systems is facing really difficult labor shortages. And so is there a way to be able to target these, target with AI, the ability to uh, replace the human element there uh, and then bring efficiency to it? And that, that's exactly what the overall organization did. It's called Codemetrics. Um, they replaced about 80% of the overall uh, coders within the organization and also reduced denials by 60%. And so that's an area that we think is here today. Now, like what's coming is, um, I'm sure everybody's kind of followed the whole uh, chat GPT and, and what's following on this. In fact, that you know they literally went from zero users to 100 million in two months. Like that's coming. Like that is, in, you know, already passed the medical exam. Like that is, that's real. Is it going to be an application tomorrow? I don't think so. But I do think that there are definitely going to be pockets and petri dishes where that's tested out. Um, and if I were back in my hospital system seat. 
I would absolutely have a strategy around how I would be using that to drive patients into my organization. I don't think patients are gonna, I think patients are gonna go to that to basically get information, uh, you know, copy and paste all the information that you have on you, get in there, and it's gonna give you some kind of diagnosis and then you're gonna use that to go talk to a human at some point. So it's that combination of digital with digital health with a human interaction. Yeah, well, I signed up for ChatGPT and asked a bunch of HIPAA questions, and they were pretty accurate. I know. I was like, well, an associate, I put it to the past, so I think it was pretty good. Um, <laughs> like, was a big deal. Yeah, no, totally. Yeah, that's really interesting, and I think, um, yeah, we're those low hanging fruit, if you will, as far as the background, kind of that coding is yep. such an important healthcare regulatory space, too, for making mistakes you're dealing with false claims act and yep. all sorts of other legal issues. I think we're, you know, when you think about like the AI, I think literally we're like first pitch of the first day. Like yeah. we are so far to go in that space, but it's going to be, I think just with what's happened in the past two months, I think it's going to be pretty rapid. Are you seeing physicians using AI technology when they're making treatment decisions? Or I've not real? seen a lot of that. Even in our companies, I mean, a lot of the technology that currently sits in there is, is risk stratification technology. Uh, so doing a lot of the front end to basically say, Identify patients that are eligible for annual wellness visits and get them in. Like that's a lot of the, the tech that's driven today. There's uh, other companies that are doing some of that within just pure automation. So you've got a lot of physicians or clinicians that are sitting on uh, telemedicine visits, and, and rather than trying to type up all their notes and code afterwards, uh, Abundance is a, is a good example of that. It's it's basically recording the, and transcribing the entire conversation, then provides the notes, and then and then uh, provides the actual coding associated with that. That's going to make that clinician's time more efficient. I think that's going to be a big driver. Yeah. So Dennis, you're you're touched on payers a little and the providers, and I wanted to focus a little on the patients or the healthcare consumers because people are more informed than ever. Um, and getting more so by the day. And I think with the retailers and other competition in healthcare, expectations are different now. And so I'd love to hear your perspective on how that drives healthcare change and investment and how it's an opportunity that you may be viewing. Yeah, um, I think a lot of it has to do with, so hospital systems still have a strong brand within each one of the communities that they serve. Um, I think that there's this element that's not been, uh, I've not seen a hospital system do it really well, where it's that end-to-end, -end, on my channel patient experience. So, you know, when depending on what segment you are, whether you're X, Y, or Z, or whether, you know, you're in a MA plan or a PACE, like being able to, to find that patient and be able to communicate with them in the preferred methodology and to help them navigate the hospital system. I mean, it's still incredibly complex, and even, I mean, you know, we all, all of us, they're living the self-care ecosystem, and, and I bet you nine times out of ten, if you have a friend or family member, and they have some kind of event, you call somebody that you know that's in a hospital system to get that person in. Um, leverage all of our resources to basically be able to do that. That isn't solved, and that's a big aspect of it. It's like, when that starts to reduce, when patients can get into the provider of which they want in a timely manner, that's when we know that we're advanced into the consumer uh, side of healthcare, but it still happens just continuously. Uh, and so that, I think, still has a lot to happen. Um, I'd also say, I was literally just in a board meeting for a hospital system right before this, and we were having a conversation of all of the technologies, the point solutions that are currently in that organization that are not integrated in with their EMR, the numbers are insane. And so most of these hospital systems are looking at that as each one of those solutions for the most part is touching one of our patients, one of our consumers, but it's not integrated to the true source of healthcare information, i.e. the EMR. Uh, and not saying the EMR is a perfect or, or even close to perfect, there's not one out there that I think is close. Um, but it all has to integrate together. And so that's a big miss in being able to like, you know, truly try to truly tie all of the healthcare information together, not only for the individual, but for the household that's ultimately making those decisions. So that to me is the big gap. If you solve it, you win, but it's a big, it's a big problem to solve. Yeah, that, that's a key challenge. 
I think we're probably at about time for questions. Um, so we'll open it up to the audience. If you have a question, raise your hand. We can bring you the mic or just shout it out and Devin will address it. Maybe address it. <laughs> <laughs> this goes back to value-based care. Uh, who's expending the greatest amount of resources to value-based care? Is it the, are we seeing more of the payer moving in that direction or is it still being pushed by what are you yeah, I'd say, uh, this is my personal opinion, to be honest. I'd say uh, I, I would go to government first. And so when you look at the overall government, like you just go into one of these hospital systems, the majority of their patients are still coming from Medicare, I mean, 40 plus percent is still being driven, whether it's Medicare or Medicare Advantage, is still being driven based off that. Now, I'd say the majority of the profitability is still coming from commercial, uh, but I think that they're getting much more advanced into figuring out how to move these patients into risk-based structures, whether that's ACOs, uh, whether that's NA or one of the other more advanced programs. And I think, you know, they're testing it out in that space. Um, and then over time, you'll start to see shared savings, you know, more care management agreements uh, attached to those commercial arrangements. Um, but it's just not, it's not really advanced. I mean, I think 5% TOPS is, is in some kind of risk structure that's not government driven. What do you think, I'll just piggyback on that, about Medicare Advantage and the shift from traditional fee-for-service Medicare to MA, which is, in Rome, just outpacing traditional yeah. by far. I mean, I, I'm not big, I mean, you know, the advance notices that came out on February 1st, I'm not the biggest fan of. I think that that has a material impact on, on a, not only the plans, but I think a lot of the patients, and I think a lot of the innovation that's ultimately occurring. Um, but I do believe strongly in the transition from Medicare fee-for-service to some kind of a space structure. I think we've quite proven that Medicare fee-for-service is not the answer, and so we have to move to some other arrangement. I think, you know, the pioneer ACOs, if you go back 10 years and where they were originating, where they've gone from, I, I think that, you know, it's on the right track. It took 13 plus years to get to where we are, going from, you know, even the advanced track into the direct contract entity rebranded as ACO Reach, but I actually really like that. I think that it's one of the few programs that has truly potential to impact uh, medical management. When you look at the differences between ACO reach and MA, I mean, MA you have, in, you will see what happens again with the advanced notice of what happens in 24, uh, but you have the ability to impact RAF. You have that ability to truly get in there and drive that element. Um, and I don't know if all of the risk plans have been able to prove medical management, whereas if you're going to be successful in the ACO REACH program, you actually have to be impact uh, medical management. I mean, you're capped on a RAF standpoint from 3%, uh, and so now it's only about being able to create a narrow network around that, uh, which you have the ability to do your own contracting around. So if you think about what the payers have done, their 15% on the administration fee uh, for all of their narrow networks, it's the same thing, you're building your own. Um, and so I think there's a balance of those two, but I also think there's great opportunity within the duels world as well as PACE. And, you know, PACE has been talked about a lot. I don't, you know, there's been, I think Innovage may be the only organization that's gone public with that. Uh, but, you know, Trinity and Providence and UPMC have a massive, I think they have the top three PACE plans out there, and I think there's a big opportunity within that space as well of truly caring for those individuals at that level uh, that need, like, you know, interaction on a daily basis and getting them into uh, a pace plan. Yeah, thank you. And um, looks like we have a question. You know, I, I think it's a, it's so the question was around, you know, that was a big announcement to the man of saying that they're going to leave the commercial world and completely focus on Medicaid and Medicare. Um, I, if I were, and again, I'm not, I'm not involved in human in any way, I think it's a really big call. Like, if I sit back and look at their the majority of their revenue, the majority of their profitability is all tied to Medicare advantage uh, and Medicaid. And they've put a material investment alongside Welch Carson in being able to build up that primary care network in the Cinewell. And I don't know the exact numbers, but it seemed like the commercial, they had never really just got that commercial traction. And so I think they're doubled down on the areas in which they've been able to, to show results and truly impact and basically drive open enrollment and profitability through the organization. I think it's a good call for them. 
Now, is that the right call for every one of these plants? I don't think so. Like, if you're sitting in United Shoes where you've got a majority not sitting in a sitting commercial, like, I don't, you, you would never make that call. Um, uh, but that's kind of how I look at it. I think it was just a really good call for Humana. Uh, and I also find them to be probably the most innovative in the state in a you know, partnerships because that's the core of their business and they really want to figure out how to drive that alongside the different partners they have outside of the core asset, which is the primary care space being similar. So follow up to that would be how do you see play wellness programs going in the future with great attention and how employers are going to move employees with uh, bigger packages, more coverage, but not necessarily more effective. Yeah. So the question's around really like um, Really impact like what is the what's the impact to the um, to the employers like what's the impact to the employers overall and what happens there um, you know I don't know I mean that's a space that, that I feel like and I go back to the Vanguard days where we had um, you know forty seven thousand employees and the total self insured employees were were closer to eighty plus um, you know we tried a lot of the point solutions we never really got. Any and I think that what ultimately occurs there is that these these employers that are self-insured are going to do something similar to what the, the government is driven on these narrow networks. And so they're going to find organizations that are willing to take risks in the worlds of which they have high, you know, a high um, a high population of their overall employees. Um, it's it's kind of, I mean, I think that's, if I were in the shoes of running HR for an organization, that's what I'd be honed in on because the, the rate increase, the broker fees and all that, it's not going down. So they have to figure out a way to get their arms around it. And I think that it probably is going to happen within the next year or two just because of the true impact, uh, at least in, I think of the healthcare system, of labor. I mean, those costs have increased so dramatically from 2, 5 to 12%. Uh, nobody's p and can handle that, uh, especially when you're running somewhere between a 1 to you know, 12% margin. Um, and so all of them are going to be, you know, that expense load is somewhere between 50% to 65% of their overall, uh, if you think of the expense load of their entire, like that's salaries and benefits, you're probably 55 to 65% of their overall expenses, and that go, if that's going up at 12%, they're running a 2% margin, the math doesn't work. And so they're going to have to figure out a way to hone in on that population and do different things. And I think the only way to ultimately do that is find partners within the community that are willing to take some sort of risk around that. And, Nobody likes to say it, but narrow networks are a good way to do that, uh, or drugs and employer contracting. Um, I don't think it's a negative for the employees. Like, I really don't. I think that being able to pick the high quality, low cost provider in each one of these markets and use that as your organization, I don't think ultimately it's going to be, going to be you know, what happens long term. And it's also going to cut the cost of whoever's you know, high cost in that market, you know, only has one way to go. Yeah, great question and follow on. Anyone else have a Hard question or easy question for Devin. So just talk a little bit about the financial state of hospitals and health systems, especially as some of this pressing transitioning to care at home. And what do you see happening? Yeah. Um, uh, so I think I think hospitals own the relationship with the patient. If you back up and you just say like, what what drives healthcare? It's always driven by the pen of a clinician, right? It's either a physician or an MP or an advanced primary care uh, or advanced uh, primary um, clinician that has the ability to you know, decide on what happens to you as a, as a patient. So I think making sure that each one of these hospital systems, again, if I were running strategy, would we'll be owning the physician network, making sure that you have strong relationships with the uh, employee physicians and clinicians that you have, as well as the independent network around you, making sure that you're adding true value to them. That, I think, drives a lot of the strategy of where patients are going to be directed. Because today, they're not driven by a lot, but they, but they are driven by what the clinician ultimately tells them to do. Uh, the second aspect of that is, I think that they, I think more of these organizations are going to start, will figure out that 20% of their overall payer mix is driven by, 20 to 30% is driven by commercial, average, not, not across everybody. That's probably close to 80% of the profitability. Um, and so if you think about the overall cost structure of the hospital system, you have to figure out how to make money on Medicare. The easiest way to get paid 
the easiest way is to shift them into some, well, one, your operating structure, and the second is to move that into some risk space where you can fit. So not only do you have the ability to make the reserves, but you have the ability to make some kind of shared savings uh, long term. And so if you back up, you know, 10 years, I don't think you had that option. Uh, I think the only way to make money on Medicare in most cases, in Medicaid, was to, to really have a really efficient cost structure. I think now that's shifted, and now you have the ability to, to do risk-based arrangements around it. So, you know, my focus would be be the uh, low-cost, high-quality provider in every market that's willing to do risk-based arrangements, not only in the commercial, or not only in the in the uh, you know CMS world, but also direct to employer and with in the right way with commercial arrangements, but being really thoughtful around how you move those contracts because. Again, if the majority of profitability is tied to that, you want to move that really slow. That's a great question. And as the population ages, put some pressure there. Um, I think I saw a question. At the um, curious your perspectives on telehealth. Like, where do you see opportunities there and challenges coming out of the pandemic where it seemed to have quite a, quite a spike and maybe it's tailing off? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I kind of cheated in that kind of question because we, we have a company that we started a few years ago called, called Trillion which is taking a bunch of analytics, uh, claims analytics, and then using that to basically push out um, almost like Monte Carlo, some Monte Carlo like simulations of what's happening in the healthcare ecosystem and push out reports on that. Uh, and the latest report that they pushed out in 22, I don't, don't quote me on the exact numbers, but it was, it was you know, 70% of the telehealth volume dropped between pre-COVID to now, outside of one space. Can you guess what it was? And so that is a space that is, is, I don't see like that going away. I think it kind of heats up over the um, next couple of years. We're making the material investments. Not only, we don't think there's a really good uh, behavioral health platform out there that we've seen. Um, it ties together the virtual side, the at-home side, and then when needed, you know, the outpatient residential world, and like that full health, that full ecosystem around behavioral health. I think it's going to happen. And I think that that's going to be solution to help patients you know that are here access it if you need more you can continue to go up that acuity level but then you have somewhere to go that continues to support you when you leave i think that's kind of been a miss in that space i'm not saying i know it really well but like you go to treatment and then you come out and you don't have that that supportive network that's consistent over time it's representing the same brand same philosophy same so i see that you know being a continuation of it um, but yeah, if we're making big bets in the, in the telehealth space, that's that's where we're making. The other one that we made a, a material investment on in the telehealth space um, is this company called Station MD, which is supporting the IDD population. Uh, so these are individuals that you want to keep in the routines um, and Medicaid-driven. But uh, they Station MD has a 94% at-home treat, uh, meaning that when a patient has you know the flu or you know anything. The, being able to provide them telehealth support from a, uh, a physician so that they don't have to leave their group home or wherever they are, uh, that's, a, that's a big disruptor because what happens there is they end up going to the emergency room and over 50% of the time once they hit the emergency room, straight into inpatient. So the cost of ultimately hits the Medicaid line uh, from a CMS perspective is pretty, pretty material. And so that's another space that I don't think has been solved. Uh, and so I think you have to come up with really unique solutions there. And so. I'd say you know, broadly, it's it's less about just telehealth and focused on our populations that really um, need that support. Yeah, great question, and thanks for that answer. Um, I think we're at time, so I want to thank Devin for being here and sharing his wisdom.